I'm going to structure the talk, uh, just talk about the role of the site architect within the project, um, how it came to be that we had a site architect on site, um, kind of day-to-day -day, um, process of, of what we do on a kind of daily basis, and look at a few specific examples of kind of issues that have arisen on site and how we've dealt with them. And then uh, a little whip through some photos of uh, what site looks like at the moment, for those of you who haven't been around, and then any questions at the end. So um, probably be quite quite quick uh, talk. Um, so start off with the role within the project. Um, me, I joined Design Engine in 2008 at the back end of 2008, so I've been working for them for four years, um, all on Oxford Brooks. I uh, joined them um, at the concept stage, just after the concept stage, and um, went through the various gateways with the university, um, and then through the planning process, um, and obviously doing the, uh, the production information um, for the project, and then as it came onto site, um, I was asked to be site architect um, for Design Engine. I shared the role split between two people. It's one role, but we split it over the week, which means that um, we're not on site 100% uh, of the time, which means we get some time back in the office to uh, catch up on stuff. It also means that it's got two, two sets of eyes, really. The university gets the benefit of kind of two sets of people looking at... at um, stuff on site and everyone's kind of uh, been working on different aspects of the building so you get a broader range of kind of looking at um, issues on site. Uh, I was specifically responsible for the coordination with the structural engineer, I think Ramble had been here talking and also um, latterly the M&E coordination and um, I was responsible for various packages, architectural metalwork package, various packages um, uh, on the building site. Um, we're design engine, or uh, the architects are also lead consultants, so we kind of um, are responsible for coordinating the design team. Um, they've been working a bit longer than me on, on Oxford Brooks. Um, and obviously Richard Jobson's been in and given you a talk on the kind of concept of, of the building. Um, and that's available on the Build Talk website, as you kind of know. Um, and that's, that's a good one to have a look at the kind of the, the underlying concepts of uh, the design. What I'm going to talk about is really the delivery on site. So if you want any more kind of information on that, it's, it's best to kind of look at that. But if you've got any further questions, I kind of know about that sort of stuff as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we were appointed, uh, the, the uh, project's been delivered under an NEC contract. Um, and as part of that, there's a role under the contract as site supervisor, which means that you're responsible for um, uh, ensuring the testing um, and checking of things on site. As part of that role, we're appointed separately to our, um, our architecture role as site supervisor. And as part of that, we propose that um, having site architects and also site engineers would be a, a good idea for the project. And it's something that the university um, have accepted and they're paying for these extra services um, to have us on site, which is something that they didn't have to do, but it means that um, the quality of what's going to be built out there is going to be much, much higher by having someone um, on site all the time. <clears throat> it's something we believe strongly in the sort of delivery of this, of this building is going to make a real difference. Um, so there's obviously a lot of work prior to site. There's the kind of conceptual end, uh, the briefing process, um, very kind of early sketchy stuff. There's the planning process, which was kind of quite a long um, uh, time in its own right. And then there's a, a whole series of kind of producing the production drawings and production information, really getting into the detail of the project. Um, <clears throat> the production information, obviously each, each one feeds into the other. So at the planning stage, you're, you're still very closely related to the concept, but even at the production information stage, the concept is still very strong in terms of how you detail the building and how it follows through. I think that's really important when you're working on site that you've kind of... Um, it, it really helps to have been involved in all of those stages of the process because you're following through a very strong theme. You kind of understand the way the building, the way uh, we're thinking about the building <coughs> and how 
how that's delivered on site is really important um, in terms of uh, having a good grasp of the, the concept at the beginning. <coughs> So on site, um, I think pretty much all of these characters have been in to talk to you. Lang O'Rourke are responsible ultimately for the delivery of the building. They're the main contractor and um, it's up to them to deliver the project to the drawings and specification that we've um, given them. Uh, but then within um, the site team, um, we're, we're on site really to manage the quality of the project. So we're looking at uh, the quality of the materials and the quality of the workmanship that's going on on site. Um, there's uh, other consultants who are appointed to manage um, the other aspects of the cost, time, quality triangle, which I'm sure you know about. So Turner and Townsend project management manage the programme, they manage the time, make sure it's going according to, to programme. Um, Turner and Townsend cost consultants are appointed to make sure we're staying on track in terms of the budget. Um, Oxford Brooks also have appointed a uh, clerk of works, which they use for, um, I think, a lot of their projects um, on site to check from the university end that um, what's being built is in, is in accordance with what they want. And um, as a site architect, that's a, a real key role to have someone there <coughs> that you can talk to very experienced at how buildings are, are put together and he's, he also feeds into the time aspect of kind of where they are on site and tracking program and, um, and also looking at sequencing. Um, <clears throat> someone who's generally uh, come up through, um, through the trades and worked on uh, as a, as a well, out on site and has got that kind of experience rather than coming from a kind of um, university background. And then there's uh, two site engineers, structural engineer um, and uh, site engineers who, again, are on site uh, most of the week. And they're checking, obviously, the bits that they're responsible for designing. <coughs> so this is, our, this is the central courtyard, which I'm sure you're all aware. This is um, the site uh, compound and um, our... Offices are here for the design team, and that's what it looks like inside, which is pretty grim. Um, and those two characters are two of the people, uh, one from Tanner and Townsend, one from Grantmire, just having a chat. Um, but all of those, those kind of companies that we saw before <coughs> are obviously really represented by people. It's the people on site who are, who are delivering it, and it's kind of the relationships with the people on site. It's a real benefit of having everyone on site, at least some of the time of the week, to be able to, um, to, to communicate, really, with, with people directly, rather than it going through emails or telephone calls. It's really the, the fast tracking of, of, um, of questions and getting things answered that's a real benefit of having site, pro, site presence. <coughs> So, also on site, and I haven't got a photo of their offices, but obviously you can see that for the design team, it's a pretty small element of it. And there's a whole raft of kind of uh, the contractor who's delivering it on the top level. And then the way this is structured, there's kind of the subcontractors on the next level down. So, there's Lang O'Rourke, who each have their managers who are managing um, various uh, subcontractors within there. And then there's all these companies who come in and specialise in their own um, elements. So, um, picking one at random, Planet, for example, do um, glazed screens. So they'll be responsible for all the glazed partitions that you see in there. They have guys not necessarily continuously on site, but they'll have um, office accommodation. And those guys will come in as they're delivering it and as they're starting up. So part of, part of the process, um, a very important part, of being a site architect is really talking to the guys who are actually building it rather than um, just to the main contractor all the time. Although everything has to go through the main contractor as well, it's really talking to these guys and getting their experience. And obviously there's an awful lot of subcontractors. All of those guys are kind of specialists in their own areas and they've all got a lot more knowledge 
on their individual areas than we have generally as architects. Um, so really being able to talk, talk to those guys, communicate with those guys on site is uh, the benefit really. <coughs> So with the trade contractors, the way that process works is um, we produce uh, production information at one stage. So this is the stair in the Abercrombie Atrium. Um, we kind of say what we want. We want the handrail to be like this, and we want the gains to be like this, and that's how we want it built. Um, and then the, the trade subcontractors reinterpret what we've done based on how they're actually going to build it. So, um, so they produce their own drawings, <coughs> shop drawings, which then they submit back to us for comment. And um, it goes through a, uh, a digital uh, system so that they upload it onto the internet and then we can download it, comment it, and send drawings backwards and forwards. Um, so when we get their drawings, we then scribble all over it and say, yeah, we don't like this, and have you thought, have you remembered that you need to coordinate with someone here? Um, and that isn't quite what we drew, do it again. Um, and then sometimes they, there's a good reason they haven't done it, and they'll come back to us and say, um, yeah, but if we do it that way, it isn't going to work for us for this reason, and we can kind of go backwards and forwards. <clears throat> if we do all of that going backwards and forwards through drawings, us commenting and then them re-uploading and us going back, it can take quite a long time. And um, part of the benefit of um, having, being on site, being a site architect, is that you can um, quite often shortcut some of this program by talking to people face to face and sitting down with their drawing and our drawing and um, going through exactly what the issues are. And so that next time they, go, they submit it, they, they get it spot on. And we kind of know what's coming. Um, <clears throat> And then the kind of final step in the pro well, the middle step in the process is them, them building it. So that's the same stair with them installing it. And because we've had the benefit of kind of, we've drawn it in the first place and then we've commented on their drawings, when it turns up on site, we know exactly what they're supposed to be building. So it's much easier to check that what they're doing is in accordance with the drawings and the specification. We're happy with it. And then the final stage is kind of snagging it, going, going around and checking that they have done it all, all correctly. Um. <coughs> so day-to-day -day <laughs> process. Um, this is in no particular order, really, but uh, the process of um, one of the things I do on a day-to-day -day basis is check how materials that are coming onto site, how they're being received, how they're being stored. Um, so this was um, some door frames for the Abercrombie building, obviously not particularly well stored there. Um, and that subcontractor isn't working anymore for, for the project. Um, so it's just checking that uh, it's, it's not really, um, the, the, within the specification there's various um, uh, temperatures and humidities of various materials have to be brought on site and it can't exceed or go beyond those. So it's just checking and making sure that things are being done in accordance with, with the specification that um, they've got a chance of actually building it with what's being brought to site. Um, <clears throat> and that what we're going to get is a, a decent quality. Um, so walking around site, I mean, there's, you've probably seen from, from the university, there's an awful lot of false work and an awful lot of building that goes on in order to build the building. <clears throat> so all of the scaffolding which is erected and goes up and down, um, all of the propping and everything, but we don't, we don't get involved in that at all. That's down to the contractor of how they build it. Um, we've got a duty as designers to make sure it can be safely built, but how they actually choose to do it is up to them. But in terms of uh, what materials they're using for that formwork, um, for example, checking that that's a decent quality ply and it's not um, a, a cheap quality ply, which is not going to work when they use it as a formwork. Um, how they're storing this timber, 
how they're propping that formwork, all of that sort of stuff we keep an eye on as we're walking around site on a day to day uh, basis. <coughs> Um, and then probably the main thing that, that we, we keep an eye out for is the quality of what's actually being built on site. Um, so this, this is the formwork that's been constructed on site. And the carpenters out there who are building the formwork for the concrete are really excellent um, uh, contractors. And uh, the, the, they've done, when you see that sort of detail of where they've, um, met the timbers and, and uh, done a really crisp job, you know that you've got a fighting chance when they cast that concrete of getting a really good finish at the end. Um, and that, that's it when it's finally been cast. But walking around, what you see is, is that, which is kind of what you're expect, inspecting in the first um, instance because by the time that's cast, it's almost too late, really. Um, so you've got, you've got to really... Um, be aware of what's going on at the front end rather than just looking at the product of <clears throat> what's been done, um, what, what's finally been done. And then there is obviously also a process of going around and checking that we're happy with all of that. Um, there's a, I mean, there's quite a long process on site of choosing how, the, how this form works kind of um, built up and uh, that involves kind of test panels and so on. So the type of timber that we use, the release agent that we use, the wax, how these nails are put in. Um, they were using nail guns to start off with, and we said, no, we want them all hand put in. All of that's done in kind of uh, sample panels and then um, a test area, and then before we get onto the real thing um, in terms of building it. Um, and all of this is just to ensure that the quality that we get <coughs> at, at the end of the day is really what we're after, which is really we're after the highest quality building that we can here. So day to day, the, the, um, we kind of go around the site um, and we're sort of systematically go around the various buildings and the various areas um, that we can. And um, we're picking up issues that there are on site. And in the first instance, we, we try and talk to the um, contractor. So within Langer Rock, each, um, each uh, different trade contractor has got their own package manager. Um, and, the, and so we, we tend to know which package manager is responsible for which area. So we see something that we're not happy with. We talk to the guys on site in the first instance, and we talk to uh, the package manager at Langer Rocks. And, um, we generally record it in uh, what we call a site observation report. So um, we're not formally raising this as kind of a defect at this stage. We're just saying there's something here we're not too happy with. Why is it like this? Or um, we, think, we think we need to look at this again. Um, and and as, as a process of that, we go through that with the, with the main contractor, both before we issue this report and then through the report. And, um, we're just checking that that um, that they're they're picking up things that that uh, the that we're aware of, um, and a lot of the time they're thinking they're thinking about how they're going to build it in the immediate term, and we're thinking about how it's going to look at the end. And um, so we we're kind of trying to think ahead of of what's going on immediately on site and how what the quality is going to be at the end of the day. <clears throat> um, if, if it isn't satisfactory resolved through that process and there is a defect on site, um, through the contract that we raise was uh, the defects notice. So um, we, we have to list out uh, where the defect is, what it is, and um, that gets issued to the contractor. And under the contract, they've got um, a certain period of time in order to make that good. Um, and that's really all the power we have um, as site architects really is to issue that. We don't have the power to, um, to instruct the contractor directly. That remains with the project manager. <clears throat> and 
And then the final kind of process, really, once things are being built, is, um, is going around snagging what's been done. Um, which you might see me walking around the Abercrombie building um, with one of these little devices. And it's uh, a system that Lang O'Rourke used called Priority One, um, which is a dig handheld digital device. And what they've done is taken all of our <coughs> GA drawings and loaded on all the room layouts. And so that <coughs> in any room within the, the building, you can kind of click on there and it comes up with a little plan. When you're still in the room, you can, you can snag that room and you can um, add little points that say um, the wall's dented here or you're missing a stop bead there or wh whatever the issue is. Um, and then that all gets, uh, you assign that to a subcontractor and then that all gets split out and sent automatically to all of their subcontractors so that they know that they have to go back and fix whatever we're not happy with in that room. And then that can generate various reports on, on what percentage of um, snags are still outstanding and how far they've got to go in order to close, close the project out. Um, one of the major snags we've had, um, or one of the major problems we've had on site generally is people writing on the concrete. It's an exposed concrete frame through a lot of the building, but most of the follow-on trades um, who are used to working in concrete frame buildings are used to the concrete frame being covered up and so they tend to write their um, calculations or phone numbers or hospital appointments or whatever they've got on their mind while they're on the phone directly on the concrete frame and it's something that that um, drives us to distraction it also drives the main contractors to distraction because <clears throat> they, they talk about it in their inductions they talk about it at toolbox talks all the time don't write on the concrete it's the finished thing but um, people still do so, and then day to day is kind of um, when I get onto site, there generally be two or three people who come over and kind of say, oh, I've got this question that needs to be answered today. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's generally questions um, that, that you can respond to pretty much, some of them pretty much straight away, you know the answer. Always the starting point is the contract information. So you go back to the drawings and the specification and look through those. And generally, um, if it's pretty clear, they don't raise the question. So generally, queries are about interfaces probably between stuff that's down to us to design. So there'll be uh, packages which are completely architect designed, and then there'll be packages that are contractor design or specialist design, which have some design responsibility for the subcontractor. It's generally the interface of those meet, where people say, well, we're expecting you to design that bit, or we're expecting you to design that bit, um, and questions kind of arise there. The benefit of being on site is you can go out and have a look at what the query is um, directly and talk it through with the people who are trying to build it there and then. So you kind of get a good grasp of the issue straight away. Whereas when you're, when you're in the office and you get um, an RFI, request for information, come through, which is just written down, it can sometimes take you quite a long time to work out exactly what the question is, what's going on, and why they're raising it. Um, and, and then you're, normally that feeds back into a pretty quick response, which means that you've shortcutted all of, all of that paperwork, all of that time in the office by being on site and kind of getting straight to the, the heart of the problem. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it's something that the subcontractors appreciate um, being able to talk to us. It's something you've got to treat with a little bit of caution because you can end up being on site and having your whole time just answering questions about stuff that's just available in the drawings because they just can't be bothered to look at the drawings. But, um, but you, tend to, you tend to kind of um, get a feel for, for when people are, are um, being lazy and when people have general... Gen genuine problems. <clears throat> so, some of the some of the things we carry about on site generally, just in the bag, a um, little spirit level, um, a torch, uh, tape measure. They're pretty self-explanatory, really, for um, checking what's been going on. Um, and we carry an iPad about, which is the first time I've kind of used an iPad on site. And that's got 
all of our drawings, all of the other consultants' drawings on, and um, has been brilliant because rather than having to carry a whole folder of drawings, I think on this project now there's about ten and a half thousand documents, um, and to have all of those at, at hand means that when you're stood in a room out on site and you think, oh, that doesn't look quite right, or I'm not quite sure what's going on there, you've got instant access to exactly what it should be and you can very quickly find it and generally with the con with the contractor or subcontractor um, which again saves an awful lot of time and it's also useful for having a meetings because you can imagine the amount of files you'd need to carry that sort of information has been been really good um, yeah. and of course uh, one of the most important things on site is safety. I'm sure Lang and O'Rourke talked about that at the time. Um, so we obviously um, comply with all the um, PPE and so on that you need to wear on site. Um, and uh, part of being on site, um, we attend sort of regular safety things. So we've done the Lang and O'Rourke harness training kind of um, talk, the CSCS card, construction skills card. And uh, Langs have their own um, mission zero um, policy, which I think they're trying to eliminate all accidents by 2020, um, which would be brilliant uh, if they can. Um, and generally, I think the site walking around is um, feels to me very safe. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So specific examples. So I'll throw this in as a, a throwback to how it was pretty much on day one when we started on site. We'd obviously been working on the project quite a long time before this, and this was um, after the enabling work. So there was already quite a lot of work in terms of demolishing the Lloyd building and um, rerouting a lot of services around this site. But this was pretty much the start of, um, of my involvement on site uh, as a site architect. And in the first phase was uh, the refurbishment of the east end of the Abercrombie building, which was done um, or almost entirely overnight. It's done by night works. So the building was being occupied during the day and then the works were being done at night, um, which means walking around site was more difficult because it's closed off during the day so that pe people can't access uh, those areas and there's no one to, to go and look at stuff with because they're all working on nights. So we set up a system where we walk around with, um, with the contractor one evening and pick, pick, pick up everything that they'd found out during the last few days or few, few weeks, because obviously while you're in the office on the end of a phone, they're in bed, so, um, which worked really well. And I think it's a balance on site of walking around with the contractor, which is really good because they're pointing out the things that they're interested in and need answers on and getting built, but you also need to walk around on your own, which is, again, is very good because um, it gives you time to stop and look at things that, um, that uh, perhaps they're not as interested in, but all they've missed and, um, and uh, gives you time to think really to yourself um, rather, than, rather than being rushed around by other people. <clears throat> so I think it's important to have the balance of the two, two ways of looking around site, if you like. Um, so. So I start, say, um, stripping out of Abercrombie building. Um, there are a number of things working with an existing building that no matter how good your kind of survey of the building, you can't really get into until you start stripping the building out. So this was, this was a room which we had down is just paint this wall, um, which is obviously uh, covered in kind of uh, blobs of adhesive and, and rubbish. Um, so it's things like that where until you go and look at it on site, um, walk around with the contractor and then build, by being there you can make very quick decisions of what, what the best thing to do with that is, all right, add a layer of plasterboard and just dab, dab it back on. That stud wall was down to stay, so I'm really in that condition, okay, we'll take it down, we'll build a new one, it'll be quicker for the contractor to do, we'll get a better finish at the end of the day, it's not going to cost the client very much money. Um, there's probably no more than lining it over wood. So uh, those sort of decisions are very easy to take for the benefit of kind of, uh, of both, both parties, really, and for the client. Um, uh, 
<clears throat> Abercrombie existing building again. Um, there's a lot of fire stopping done. The, the kind of main reason for refurbishing the Abercrombie building, uh, existing building, was to um, make it safe in the event of fire. So you'll see the fire curtains around and the creation of lobbies at each end. Um, a lot of the services fire stopped. A lot of the doors when they first went in, um, we had a suspicion, and uh, the clerk of works had a suspicion that they hadn't been properly fire stopped. And um, he showed me a trick with a hacksaw blade where you push it down the edge of the door frame and pull it out. And if on the hacksaw blade it's got the um, fibre, if, if the fire stopping's improperly, it'll pull out the fibres of the fire bat and um, the um, intramescent sealant in the kind of uh, in the hole in the blade. Um, and we did that on a few doors and there wasn't any there, no evidence of any fire stopping. So um, the contractor ended up taking all the frames off of all the doors, <coughs> opening it all back up, re-fire stopping it all, opening all the ceilings up. And we inspected, we ended up having to inspect every door to ensure that all the fire stopping was in place. So it's kind of um, one of those slightly less glamorous tasks, but... Uh, from a, a life safety point of view, it's absolutely vital to ensure it's all properly done. Um, yeah. That's just a, a contractor trying, trying to rush it, really. Uh, so this is uh, Abercrombie Atrium. And uh, this is our design drawing for the elevation of that, that atrium. Um, the concept of the atrium was that there's a slightly uh, louder, buzzier kind of space at the bottom um, and we wanted to acoustically isolate the officers at the first floor. Um, so they've got full height glazed screens and then it goes to uh, the studio space, it goes to uh, glass balustrade as you go up. Um, so originally these, these uh, just full height glass screens along, along the atrium there. Um, <coughs> We came to open it up on site. Um, this is what we found within, um, within those uh, panels, um, which is uh, an upstand beam running all the way along. So uh, where we had uh, full height glass all the way along here, instead there's a concrete, concrete beam, which when you think about it, it's obvious because the structure here, they've omitted a column every other one in order to span that, they've added a beam across. Um, but it's something that was never picked up on the building survey, it's something no one had any idea was actually there. Um, so, as part of, <coughs> that's just another view from inside. So, the contractors on site at this stage, he said, we've discovered this beam um, we need to crack on because it's delaying us. What do you want to do about it? Um, we can either chop the beam out and add some steels underneath, or um, we can clad over the, clad over the beam. Um, so we looked at both options, and um, in the end, <coughs> we decided mainly for uh, cost and time reasons, but also because we, we were sort of happy with, with keeping it keeping it, was um, that we keep all of the beam along here and not take it out, which meant that they didn't have to prop under here and add steels here, and then we had to resolve how we were going to do that, the junction underneath in terms of supporting it. Um, and we would add uh, a cladding around it. So what we've done is where the, where the beam's there, we've, we've raised it up to form the barrier load and then down spec the glass to save the money on the loading that would, it would have had to be designed for to stop, stop you being able to push it out and then introduced kind of uh, cladding around it. So that whole process was able to happen very quickly because we, dis we discovered the beam, we were on site um, with the contractor, we were able to see, oh yeah, it's there, measure it um, and, then, and then develop the proposal very, very quickly and get it um, approved by the client and then um, into kind of um, the, then that allowed them to crack on with everything else without having to worry about propping this and chopping the beam out and so on. So it's uh, sort of an example of where being on site means it, uh, you can deal with it much quicker and keep the project moving rather than um, it taking time in terms of coming out and visiting the 
and going backwards and forwards. Um, and then, as you, you're sort of familiar with that space now, you can kind of see along there now, we've just got, we've still got the concept of the glass running all the way down, and um, the beams now hidden behind with the um, kind of painted out black um, in that level one, level one space. <clears throat> um, and then similarly, in the Abercrombie extension, we've, we've done the same trick. So where the Abercrombie building spans over, that section of um, facade has got a full height concrete truss in order to um, bridge over the, the cut through down to the central courtyard. So it's a very similar concept to what they used um, in the 1950s. Um, that's how it was cast first off. So the guys have, <clears throat> have uh, put up formwork and within that truss, you can imagine there's an awful lot of uh, reinforced steel and they've poured the concrete in. And um, you can kind of see where they haven't been able to get down with the, the pokers. They've obviously got to poke it down from the top and they haven't managed to get the concrete to go around the rebar enough. In fact, you can see the Sinclair building straight through um, that truss. So, um, again, you obviously see it on the side, it's a defects notice, what are they going to do about it? Can you get them to take that whole wall down? Not really, it's, it's a lot of work to take all of that down. Um, the first leg of the lecture theatre that they did cast um, they left the formwork on for uh, probably about a week and um, when they took the formwork off it looked brilliant and then over the next couple of weeks they found that the texture concrete was um, coming away um, and we were losing all of, um, all of the texture and kind of powdery um, where it's just flaking off and uh, that was down to leaving the formwork on too long and that section of concrete which um, was a big wall um, they did take down, and that took them probably um, three or four days to put the formwork up and cast it. Um, it probably took them about two weeks to take that wall down. And it was a big process to, um, to condemn, condemning some of this stuff. So the program implications of taking this down when they're trying to put the next floor on, bridge over, uh, massive. Um, so even though all of this is aesthetically enhanced concrete, so we're going to be exposed at the end of the day, we accepted that for these areas they locally locally make good. Um, and at this stage in the project, um, we hadn't seen what they are capable of in terms of um, making concrete good, and we we're, were quite nervous about it. Um, now we've gone kind of through the process, and concrete finishes have been on site. We're a lot more confident that, that they can actually make things like this um, look really good at the end of the day. Um, so that's the first process they went through in terms of uh, cutting it back, uh, taking all the loose concrete out and applying chemical to um, allow the new concrete to adhere to it. Um, <clears throat> and then that's the first stage of scratch cake, kind of reinforcing structural concrete, ready for a finishing cake um, to come back on. Um, and and that's how this, the space kind of uh, ended up. You can just see it down the end there. Um, that's all the offices now. The truss going over. And that's what it looks like. <laughs> Pretty much looks like now. It's in the back of someone's office. But um, so they've done a really good job. If you go out there, you'll see it, but only if you look for it. Um, <clears throat> and then this was this was the application of the roof um, membrane <clears throat> on the top of the new Abercrombie building, which is specified as a hydrotech system, and uh, um, when they started installing this on site, they realised that uh, 
Um, just by being on site, being able to see the materials, you can see that they've got permaquake rather than a hydrotech membrane, say. Um, kind of, you can immediately raise this rather than having installed the whole lot. You can say, well, what's going on? Why are you installing this? It's the wrong product. And, um, and uh, quickly get a solution in terms of, uh, of why they're installing that and, uh, and what's going on. Um, as it turned out, this was a contract proposal to substitute one for the other as, uh, uh, to generate a saving. And um, this is something that we hadn't seen any details of drawings for at the time, um, so we were able to get the details and, and, um, and get them to give us the details of what they were going to install before they installed it so that we were able to inspect it. Well, <laughs> the hardest thing on site really is if they're trying to install something and you've no idea how it's supposed to be installed or what it's going to interface with or how, how it works. So um, it's the most important thing to get the information before they start. So start doing it. So finally some kind of views of how it is on site at the moment. Most of you are quite familiar with this, but um, so I'll just run around. This is um, from the playing fields, from Chen Yang playing fields. Um, <clears throat> and the food hall steel's coming out. Uh, that's going to support the food hall roof. Um, the cladding's pretty much uh, getting there on uh, the library building, the teaching building. A few more square on of that. Steel work going up, steel work erection. Um, this stuff, these guys are, <coughs> are craning this beam in, which is a pretty massive beam, three meters high. Um, and it's supported on these, um, these steel forks. Um, all of that, all of that is temporary work, so say. All of those steel columns, which I'm sure you've probably seen out there, are massive and they're all going to be taken down at the end of the day and taken away. So it's, there's an awful lot of building which goes on on site which isn't their building um, in order, in order to, to realise at the end of the day. You have the library block from the north. <clears throat> the saw teeth, which I think Richard talks about in his lecture, which is just finishing, finishing off the framework, which will be six eight on top there. Richard's photos. <laughs> The crane, it's still got two cranes on site, one's going to come down pretty shortly. I think. Um, and again, that's been a uh, working on site, you kind of realise the major constraints that the contractor has, and the crane time is one of the biggest in terms of moving stuff about, about the site, in terms of access materials on the site and tra travelling around, which generates issues on its own in terms of how stuff's stored, um, where stuff's stored. Here in the central courtyard. And cut through, they're just starting to install the um, the rest of this diagonal stair which is coming down into the courtyard now. So hopefully pretty soon the roof. <coughs> That's a view of the main forum space that is pretty much at the moment, uh, with the lecture theatre in front of you. So again, you can see the amount of scaffolding and so on in that space. Um, at the top, there's kind of a, a big crash deck where they're still working on um, fitting the main roof up above. Um, and uh, kind of walking around site as a site architect, you're kind of looking at this stuff with um, what would be in your mind of which bits are going to be exposed at the end of the day, which bits of concrete, 
you're not too worried about, which bits you are very precious about, and um, kind of what's being installed at the moment, what's going to follow on from that, and what can affect each other. Um, <clears throat> That's looking the other way back out to the central court. That's it.